talking tabby. You know my guys is never short. It's time to sit down and let the DJs cook. That's right. You know they coming through and getting heavy. It's time to talk some dynasty and talk some tabby. My guys is never short. It's time to sit down and let the DJs cook. Get out. Welcome back to episode four of Debbie Degens. Uh, I'm Noah Green, and with me as always is Todd Vincent. Todd, when I heard that song today, all I could think of was Coach Prime with Give Me My Theme Music. I was just feeling it. How are you doing this week? <laughs> good, good. You? I'm doing good, man. Um, great week. And uh, got to actually watch some college football, which is great. Uh, and I've actually cleared out my work schedule. So I'm going to have Saturdays now free. So I will actually be able to watch games in real time. Spectrum has worked out its little feud with ESPN. So we're back in business getting all the games. I'm excited for it. Nice. Yeah, I'm a yeah. I'm yeah. a kind of a slave to the streams up here north of the border, so we kind of get what we get, so <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, that's I, I have uh I have some other friends up in Canada and they have the same problem just with football in general. It's just it's 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 harder up there for sure. So you put in that extra work to grind and get it done. And uh that yeah, the Colorado Colorado CSU game was woo. I was unreal. It's it's unreal that Colorado is literally the team that everybody is talking about every single week now. And it's it's blowing my mind the level of attention that that team has gotten. Yeah, it's going to get real interesting now that they're getting into the meat of the schedule and playing some real teams. I'm real interested to see how that turns out. Uh, I can't wait. I'm. They've got Oregon, USC coming up, and no Travis Hunter, which is going to be a really big situation to monitor. Uh, so we will have to see how they hold up to that. But that was that was some some high drama, and, and I will give it to I will give it to Coach Prime. I will give it to Dion. He he knows how to bring attention. He knows how to create a show. And I will say. I talked about this with a friend recently. It is impressive. There are not that many examples of athletes that are that good at their craft when they are playing. Like Dion, I could easily argue Dion's the greatest cornerback to ever live. And anyone could make that argument. And not that many who are the greatest at their trade then become really good coaches. It's not that smooth a transition like there aren't that many examples so I, I i have respect for what he's i see what he's doing and it's interesting because he's that team is that team is not is well coached down the line he's brought in good people and it's really been cool to see that transition for him yeah it's been it's been something to behold so far I think uh, I think most people are pretty shocked. I mean, I mean, he has his supporters, but there are also the people that are just hoping that he fails too because they don't like his persona. They think he's too brash and over the top and whatever else it is. But uh, like, I know if you if like I mentioned watching the series that overtime YouTube series yeah. with Shador and the, it's called Prime Time Two Point Oh. You get a lot of like behind the scenes look at him and stuff, and you see that a lot of the bravado, a lot of the stuff is him. I don't want to say an act, but a lot of it is him directing stuff at himself to take it away from the team and the players itself and put everything on him because he knows he can handle it and take some of the attention and some of the pressure off the players. It's really interesting. Yeah, I think you're I think you're completely right. And I think he is I think he's real. Like I actually I watch them and I actually think he's real. I think he's real about really honing his craft and being good. Uh, watched his 60 Minutes interview, and it was interesting because they asked him about Saban. And, well, first they asked him who the best coach in the country was, and he said, what do you think? I'm going to say someone else. And then they asked him about Saban, and he said, I just see Saban as a teacher. Everything Saban does, I want to study it 
I want to do it. He's that example. And I believe him. I think he's really, he knows excellence wherever it goes. And I think he's bringing it. And I agree that I think this, a lot of what he does is A, a to pull attention away and B is marketing genius because he wants his guys to get the attention and he knows he can help to bring it. And I think then behind the scenes, he's a real dude who actually cares about his players. And he has, a there's a lot of hate out there. I am so interested to see what he does and I'm dying to get out there for a game because I want to see what that, that environment looks electric. Yeah, it does. I uh, can't wait for it. So today we're going to hop into some, we're going to share Debbie rankings and we'll talk about quarterbacks, wide receivers, and running backs. And we're going to just focus on our top 12 today. And then we'll do stock up, stock down as we always do. And next man up. So as we transition into rankings, I know you're going to pop those up on the screen. Overall, I know you do a lot of rankings, have done them for a while. I find rankings to be incredibly challenging as an exercise. And I'm curious how you, how do you think, when you go about rankings, how do you think about them just from a process perspective? Uh, yeah, so it is difficult and like, you got to kind of be fluid in it, but for like Debbie rankings, I'm just looking for the end product trying to forecast where these guys fit in ones that are going to make it to not only make it to your NFL team, but make an impact in your NFL team. That's where I think where I've talked about before, where people kind of settling almost for guys that are closer to making the league, but are lesser prospects or in my view, less prospects. I'm kind of the opposite. I go super aggressive towards guys that I think have the top, top end ceiling. And you're going to miss on some. Obviously, you're not going to hit everyone. Uh, but that's just the way that, that I like to do it. Obviously, you're going to have like those peaks and valleys along the way with value-wise, with just the production guys have and early playing time and whichever else. But I try and stay focused, unless something happens, unless it's an injury or unless guys just don't get to play. I try not to let, especially this early, let that kind of stuff, playing early playing time and stuff, differ or like, move you off of your initial evaluation from a player. So I find that you see players, especially freshmen, start to get a little playing time earlier on, uh, whether they're at a lesser of a school or just for some reason getting the coaches good graces or whatever. I don't necessarily see that early that early production or early playing time. It's obviously a positive, but it, it's not it shouldn't be something that's enough to to boost those players over someone you've had initially ranked higher, uh, especially not this early in the process. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And every season is long. I mean, we see it on the NFL side right now too. Seasons are long um, and year over year is long and players take longer to develop. So it's easy to, it's easy to want to just thrust guys really high up in your rankings, but you got to really be patient and think about talent overall, not just think about immediate production. So right now we're looking at quarterbacks. Anyone who's watching this on YouTube can see the display of our top 12 Debbie QBs from both Todd and me. And for those who are listening, maybe we can just read through, maybe Todd, you can read through yours real quick and then I'll read through mine and then we can dive in from the, from the bottom up and just talk about some of the guys we might have that are different. Uh, yeah, so uh, number one, I have Caleb Williams, obviously, and it should be pretty much everyone's number one quarterback. Uh, uh, two is Dante Moore, a freshman from UCLA. Three is Drew Larr from Penn State. Four is Drake May from USC. Five is Quinn Ewers from Texas. Six, Malachi Nelson, another freshman from USC. Uh, then I have Arch Manning from Texas, another freshman. Uh, then I have Nico Ayamaleva, the freshman from Tennessee. 
Riley Leonard from Duke. Uh, J.J. McCarthy from Michigan, Jackson Dart from Ole Miss, and then Connor Wegman from Texas A&M is my number 12. And I've got one is Caleb Williams from USC, a line there. I've got Drew Allar from Penn State as my number two and Dante Moore as my number three. I have Drake May at four, Malachi Nelson at five, Arch Manning at six, Quinn Ewers at seven, Nico Iamaliva at eight. I've got Shadur Sanders up at nine, and then Connor Wegman at 10, with JJ McCarthy at 11, and Michael Phoenix Jr. at 12. So, Todd, thinking of your sort of seven through 12, uh, how do you, how do you think about ranking these guys and I, I'm curious. So like Jackson Dart has Jackson Dart always been in your top 12 for Debbie QBs. Has he done something this year to move himself in? He's not a guy I had in my top 12 and I have him just sort of just outside, but I'm curious what vaulted him up in there for you. Yeah, he's been, he was there preseason. I'm just, I've always been a fan of his game. Um, Last year, he would have been higher. He had kind of a so-so year last year. Uh, but he's he's an interesting kid. He's got good size, really good mobility. Uh, his, he's got NFL arm strength. He makes NFL throws. Uh, he's been a lot better this year than last year. Last year, I found the problem with him it was they didn't give him the opportunity to take a lot of shots deep. Like, he likes to push the ball down the field. And it felt like... Anytime they allowed him to do that, he was just pressing too much and trying to impress with the throws. It's like he had in the back of his mind that he wanted to put these throws on tape and prove to people that he could do certain things rather than just take what the what the defense gave him. So he's been a lot he's been a lot better this year so far. Uh, he's just the guy I've, I've always been a fan of, and I he's draft eligible this year, but he's one of those guys I could see waiting until next year to declare just because next year's draft class seems a lot slimmer at the quarterback position so far. Yeah, he's inter he's interesting for me as as an SC fan. I got to watch him early in his career as a watcher of every single USC game, and he showed a lot of promise. And moving into this old Miss system has been interesting to to see him kind of grow a little bit. Like you said, he had a tougher year last year. He's shown some signs of maybe taking a leap this year in his second year of the system. I think they're, I actually think his weapons are not quite what they could. I think he's doing this with some, with, with not the highest caliber of weapons that some of the other QBs on this list actually have, which is interesting. So I think he's, he's pulling things up a lot yeah. and the dual threat ability is interesting for him. Yeah. Chris Marshall, the receiver there that's gone to Juco now because he's been a knucklehead for in a row, but kicked out of two schools. He was someone I was really high on too, who I thought would help out a lot this year. And then Zakari Franklin, the UTSA transfer, has been injured and hasn't played yet. But even with him in, all of his the top receiving threats are all G5 transfers. They have yeah. him and Jordan Watkins and uh, Trey Harris. They're all G5 yeah. transfer to P5 transfer up. So yeah, they don't have uh, they have Aiden Williams, the freshman there this year, who's getting a little bit of playing time, but yeah, they don't have any, they don't have any blue chip prospect, wide receiver prospect recruits like you'd expect a pretty decent SEC program. Now. Yeah, definitely. And I'll ask you too about Riley Leonard, because that's where in, looking at our rankings, thinking about the 24 eligible quarterbacks, I have Shador, and Michael Penix Jr. from Washington, whereas you've got Riley Leonard and Jackson Dart ahead of those guys. We both have J.J. McCarthy in the top 12. So talk to me a little bit about Riley Leonard and what puts him above all those for you. I see him right now as your QB4 for this 24 class. Yeah, he's a lot like Dart, same thing. He's he's bigger, though. I think he's 6'4", really yeah, mobile. Does a lot. He does a lot with his legs, actually. Uh, He's 
got enough arm. Not a great arm. He's not got a cannon or anything, but uh, he's been pretty productive at Duke. He's gotten a lot of attention. He's getting a lot of draft buzz as a like going into the season. A lot of people talking about as the QB three in the class. So this kind of where quarterbacks is kind of where I'll hedge my bets with guys who are already getting the attention and the buzz going into the season for the draft capital, just because it's like I said, I've said sometimes they're so volatile and it's, it's interesting to see, like, even in my rankings, having so many of this freshman class, but the guys, the Riley Leonard's and the McCarthy's and the darts Wegman, those are the guys in a Debbie draft. Those are the guys I'll, I'll have the most shares of because even though I'm ranking these freshmen, like Dante Moore is my second QB two. I'm not paying up in a Debbie draft for those guys. They're just there's just too much risk involved. Like the payoff is huge down the road if you land the next. Obviously, if you drafted Caleb Williams as a freshman, and you're you're reaping the rewards now. But he wasn't going where he's going as a freshman. And I think these freshmen, interestingly, are are going too high in Debbie drafts. I said before, like the time for me in a C2C draft is like. The supplemental draft is where it, I like to take those shots on, especially incoming freshmen, because the supplemental draft is just that. It's supplementing your actual squad. And you have a 45-man roster in the CT. I don't mind taking a high shot on a Nico or Dante Moore or whoever follows you at that at that point because he's already going to be a sixth, seventh, eighth quarterback on your roster, and you can wait on that. In the high Debbie pick, the, the chances of them coming around and – going from wire to wire as a top rated prospect all the way through getting the draft capital, making your NFL team and making a big difference is, is pretty difficult. Even after the fact of getting the draft capital, we've seen like obviously the last, even the last couple of years with the Trey Lance and Zach Wilson would be playing forward for an injury and he might not be playing for much longer the way he's playing. Even once they get the draft capital with quarterbacks, it's still, it's still a big, uphill battle so i just don't i just don't like to spend on them yeah that makes sense and we've seen there are countless examples if you look back through the top top recruiting classes of previous years of guys in these five star five star guys high four star guys that either don't get jobs end up transferring around end up moving around and just don't deliver. And it makes sense to hold off and spend more of your supplemental capital on them rather than spend really the capital and start. It's frozen. You kind of see that happen all the time with well, Penix is another guy. Bo Nix is another guy we're seeing getting all this this draft buzz now. He was a high recruit, but um, but it, it's been like a, a fifth year. And we lost them. Yeah, that's. I think that's a really good point about just being cautious in terms of spending early capital on QBs. We just see so many examples of QBs with five-star, high four-star ratings, not necessarily hitting and playing it out. So even in a class like this 2024 fresh, this 2023 freshman class, where there's a lot of five-star high-end talent, there's still a lot of risk involved to invest super high capital and high variance and chance to miss along with high chance of success. And yeah, for me, I, I have Shadur Sanders up here at nine and that could seem reactionary. I'm a little bit with you. So I see a few things that really have me put him there and I'm well aware that there is risk and that this could come back and bite me, but I just see what's going on at Colorado and the fact that he is Dion's son, I think really matters. 
I also think he's really good. He he has what he had when I watch him, I see an NFL quarterback. I see NFL pocket presence. I see NFL awareness. What he did at the end of that Colorado State game was was really noteworthy for me. And his post game interviews were interesting because they asked him what he thought when Colorado State punted the ball out of bounds and he was pinned on the two. And they said, "What what were you thinking when you were pinned on the two? And he said, "I went I went Brady mode." I went into Brady mode and my literal thought was you left me too much time on the clock. And I just think guys that have that kind of mindset tend to find a way to succeed in the NFL. I just think he's got a little something. And so I have vaulted him up to nine and I also have put Penix in my top 12 Penix. The more I watch Penix, the more I see an NFL arm. And the more I see a guy who could fling it all over the field, hit absolutely everyone, he's also got incredible pocket awareness, can really move around in there. There's some risks to putting those guys up there for me, but I, I think Shadur Sanders and Penix are have a real shot at getting some high draft capital. And again, Shadur is an interesting one too. He kind of like Dart. There's a chance he could come back for another year. So I'm I'm interested to see what his decision making looks like. And my thought with him is, if he does go this year, it's because he's going to have incredibly high. It's because he's going to have high draft capital. And I think if he does look like a top half of the first round type projection, he's going to go. If not, he may come back and even continue to increase his draft stock. So he's a really interesting bet there for me. Any other yeah, thoughts? I'm on not that? quite there with. I'm not quite there on Sanders yet, but I, I, I understand what people are looking at, and I think he's going to be a 25 class kid too. I don't think he'll go this year, but I think if he builds on this year and they bring in some more offensive talent, whether it's through the portal or just high end recruits, but he's got a shot for QB one. He's got a chance to be the first overall pick yeah. in next year's draft, which he doesn't have this year because Caleb's there. Uh, Penix is – he's an interesting guy. I mean, I like his game. His Obviously, his, his he's got NFL throws littered all over his tape, especially like the driving the ball across the field from one hash to the other, throwing outside the numbers. Um, he really puts the ball on the line too. There's not a lot of guys who can deliver the ball that kind of velocity. Um, my problem with him is he's an absolute statue in the pocket, which is – it's it's nice to see. It's fun to watch in college. It's fun to watch him take on that blitz and stand in there the last second and make those throws. I just don't know if that's a recipe for success in the NFL. But interestingly, with this being like Penix, um, Bo Nix added to the class this year, this is like the last super class with the COVID extra years and stuff. There's going to be a lot of talented day two quarterbacks this year, which yeah. is something – I don't know if the NFL is going to transition to it, but it's something I'd like to see them do more often is instead of taking on this risk of always trying to find the next guy in the first top half of the first round and sacrificing future draft capital and putting your franchise at risk or behind a couple of years, I'd like to see them take more calculated risks on day two guys that aren't going to bankrupt your team's draft capital. And there's guys all over the NFL that are, Day two picks or worse. And you see it happen yeah. all the time, especially at quarterback. It's the one position that it happens at. It's it's weird that I know like having a, a franchise quarterback can alter your future, but missing on one can alter your future just as bad in, in the other direction. And we see there's tons of guys, tons of guys all over the league that are day two guys or worse. Uh, so I, mean, I think I Phoenix is. I think because of the injury history and, and the age and everything else, I think he's going to slip to the second round. But I think that's somewhere where like a team like, I don't know, even like Seattle, depending on what Geno Smith does, or like it's it could put him in potentially a better position down the road because he's not going to end up in the first half of the first round, a team that is bad and desperately needs a quarterback. Yeah, I think that's right. And – it's I, as you were talking, I just 
literally in my head, I keep thinking, is Kyle Shanahan listening to this podcast? Is John Lynch listening to this podcast? Because I'm sure they would agree with everything you're saying right now, given that they just spent how many three first round picks to trade up for Trey Lance and have ended up being happier with seven to Rav Rock Purdy. So classic example of exactly what you're saying. But yeah, I think that's yeah. Who was literally Mr. Irrelevant, the last pick in the draft. And yep. he ends up taking the starter's job for a kid that they spent three first round picks on. That's why I mean that's like even the people who do this for a living are not good at quarterback evaluation. Yep. For sure. So it's it's interesting to see. And as we go, so going into the top half of the rankings, Caleb Williams is clearly consensus number one overall. Where I think it gets interesting is in, and we've talked about this on this pod a bunch, is just in this sort of two through six range and thinking about the future classes versus the present class. So I know we both have Drew Allar, Dante Moore, Drake May, Quinn Ewers, Malachi Nelson in that range. How do you think about ranking these players? Uh, well, Caleb's obvious, number one, but I've been like, I don't want to keep talking about, I don't want to talk bad about Drake Makes. It seems like a recurring theme for me every week, but it's kind of just like a, like I getting ahead of the, the curve on this cautionary tale of quarterback, quarterback evaluation that last year that Caleb Williams was so far ahead of the class that people just, got bored and started propping up Drake May, who was really good in his first eight to 10 games. He's not been really good in his last six or seven going over two seasons now. He did have like 400 yards passing this past week, two touchdowns, two interceptions. Uh, and the two interceptions, I didn't see the game, but I heard were not great interceptions, not great choices on his part. Um, but I've always said that there's a better chance that someone else comes up and jumps him for quarterback two than there is of him like ending up in the same tier as Caleb Williams. So part of it is that for me, that I'm not completely sold that he's a top five pick and that there's lots of football played still. And even the guys who are down lower that I, that I would take a shot on, like JJ McCarthy, JJ McCarthy's probably going to make the playoff this year. They have a stellar team at Michigan again. And it's a blue blood school. He's a five star kid. He's just, he doesn't put up gaudy stats because they don't let him pass as much as they should. But before the game this week against Bowling Green, which I'm not sure what happened there, he's been playing as good as any quarterback in the country. So, not stat wise, but he's putting these throws on tape and like evaluators are taking note of it. You see it on Twitter. You see these guys who are in the draft circles talking about it, like, hey, this is, he's picking up steam. People are talking about him. People are talking about his throws, his physical gifts whichever else that's why i've always kind of like taken those tail end guys later in the draft because you even then you can afford to take an extra shot you can take two of those guys instead of investing your first overall pick or first round pick in a quarterback that's going to be a long shot but for the guys like dante moore i've had as my debbie qb1 in this class forever and alar last year's class they also have the benefit of having probably the odds on favor right now being the number one overall pick in their draft class, right. class which is something that Drake May is not going to get. He's not going to pass Caleb Williams. He might get the top five pick. He might get the team heavily invested. In him. He might not. He might have someone pass him. Drew Lark could have someone pass him next year's class. Dante Moore could, but the potential is there for them to have a team invest in them to be the first overall pick, which goes a long way in them getting the leash to prove themselves at the NFL level. So that's kind of where I value those two guys, where I've kind of bumped them ahead of Drake May or in that tier. They're all in the same tier. They're all super talented kids, but it's difficult when you're talking two, three, four years down the road. But for me, they have that trump card of that's a possibility that they could be the number one pick. And Drake May doesn't have that anymore. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. And I put on Twitter that Jurel R was my QB2 overall and got some comments on that and had some interesting exchanges about May. And that's that's how I looked at it. I said, listen, I will take 
a guy who looks like an odds on favorite, if not the odds on favorite to be the first pick in the 25 class. And when you look at him, he has all the tools needed to be that guy. Dante Moore has all the tools needed to be that guy for 26. Those two guys have incredible talents, incredible arms. Just, it's just a matter of them putting it together and they're both starting for the first time. So it's going to take, Dante Moore hasn't played anybody of substance yet, but it's going to take them a little bit to get into it. But yeah, I'll bet on that talent for sure myself. And that's why I have them higher. And Malachi Nelson's an interesting one because we're not, we know we're not going to see him this year at all, but it's a bet on a, his talent and profile coming in, which was really good. And he's been a top three QB for me ranking those ranking the top three QBs in this class for me has always been challenging, but he's always been in the top two, three and just being Lincoln Riley's next QB to me is worth that is worth the bet and worth the investment. If you're going to invest in something and you have a shot to get Lincoln Riley's next QB, it's worth investing in because his track record is as good as anyone's in developing QBs. Yeah, I think that's also part of what the value insulation is a big thing with the Debbie QBs as well, that all these freshmen, you're not expecting them to play. So you have that entire year to see how things go next year, but people are still going to hold them in a super high opinion of them. It comes to it. The problem is when it comes to next year and they don't start, then the bottom falls out. Like you've seen with, with Devin Brown and uh, Ty Simpson this past weekend. Yeah. Ty Simpson has no, no W value now because we nope. sat on it. We waited. We said we want the next Alabama quarterback. And he was, a. I think they were both five stars or borderline five stars. So they're in the same spot. They were in the same position as these kids here. Um, so everyone made that bet. We're like, we want the five star. We want Alabama's next quarterback. They keep putting them in the league. Then it took kind of a hit when Joe Mil or when Jalen Miller was named the starter. And then this past weekend when Buckner started ahead of him, and then he played, and then now they're back with Miller as a starter. He has no he has no Debbie value now. Now you have to hope if you if you paid up last year for him and you held him, now you got to hope that he transfers somewhere and then rebuilds that stock, which is not impossible. We've seen it with Bo Nix. It can happen, but that's the risk that the bottom can fall out basically overnight on them as well. And that can happen with any player with depending on the risk and injury and whatever happens. And like we said before, these are 18, 19, 20 year old kids. They just, they're kids. They do stupid stuff and they get kicked out of schools and, stuff happens you'll never ever predict that stuff um, but you have that benefit with right now for the next year or this entire season of uh, these kids there's no expectations on them so until they give you a reason to doubt them or, or to not believe them anymore you have that value so you can decide what to do with it then but i think like dante moore starting already he should have been the day one starter we've seen that from garbers and whoever else played ahead of him he basically was. He came in the first half or the second half of the first game, and he's not going to let that up. That's even if he doesn't put up the huge gaudy stats, which I don't think he will, because he's not he's not a dual threat guy. He's he's got good pocket presence and he's mobile around the pocket, but he's not he's not going to run for a bunch of yards and score a bunch of touchdowns. But just the fact that a power five program has put their program in his hands at this age in the second second game of his career speaks a lot and gives him that value insulation going forward that unless he's a complete letdown then he has that to build on his profile already which is a huge boost to him like you said with those past guys there's guys all over if you look at all the programs there's kids all over these programs that are four high four star five star kids that they don't ever even play they just come in and they sit and then you expect them to play and then they get jumped over and then it is what it is. It's 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 impossible pr to predict. So right now you just go on the talent evaluation and the value insulation. Makes sense. Should we hit the next position group? Yeah. 
we got wide receivers next, right? Yep. There they are. All right. So for anyone listening who cannot see the screen right now, I'll go through my top 12 real fast and then Todd can go through his and we can chat through a couple of individuals on here. And once again, the the philosophy and the principle of Debbie ranking is ranking for upside. That is the way that I have looked at this. I know that's the way that Todd looks at it. We are looking for absolute ultimate upside and looking for guys that have a chance to really hit and make big splash impact both in college, but really on the next level. That's how we're projecting this. So no surprise to anyone. I'm starting with Marvin Harrison Jr. as my Debbie wide receiver one. Emeka Egbuka as my wide receiver two. Evan Stewart, wide receiver three. Luther Burden is wide receiver four. Zachariah Branch, wide receiver five. Tedaroa McMillan at six. I have Xavier Worthy at seven. Malik Neighbors at eight. I've got Antonio Williams at nine, Travis Hunter at 10, Troy Franklin at 11, and Keon Coleman at 12. What you got, Todd? Yeah, so I got no surprise. Robert Harrison Jr., number one. I have Evan Stewart as my number two. Uh, I'm at Buka, number three. Xavier Worthy, four. Zachary Branch, five. Luther Burden at six. Ted McMillan at seven, Malik Neighbors at eight, Jurion Dickey at nine, Jonte Cook at 10, and Tony Williams at 11, and Troy Franklin at 12. Awesome. Any, any big changes in these rankings for you from the beginning of the year? Uh, I've shuffled around a little bit, not a whole lot, actually. I moved Evan Stewart up. I had Evan Stewart. He was my, I think I had him, him and, and, uh, Burton at four and five, wide receiver four and five. Uh, but, but just the start Evan Stewart had and the production he's had is kind of solidifying for me that he's, his play style and there is everything like the modern NFL is looking for. And he was another guy. He was the wide receiver one or two, depends on what site you're looking at for recruiting last year. Um, he was right up there with with Luther Burden. Uh, but I just see his his ceiling as sky high in the NFL. He's like on the like a Garrett Wilson type trajectory for me. I think if you don't get in now, you're not getting him. So I just wrote an article on him last week for league winners for a Debbie spotlight. Uh, and going through all his metrics and stuff, obviously this season's boosted because there's only two games, but he's had two massive games back to back, which I wasn't sure he was going to get that type of volume. Mostly on the AM offense is what surprised me, not his not him, himself as a player. Um, but I think him leaping over Ekbuka, and Mike Ekbuka I really like as a player, but I think he's like he's like a, like a Robert Woods comp play style I come to where he, I think like if he hits his ceiling in the NFL, I think he still could be a back end wide receiver one, but he's most likely like a wide receiver two for fantasy and for an NFL team. Just his his play style doesn't doesn't really speak to your typical alpha or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but Evan Stewart I think does. So that's where I that's where I boosted him. So he's the biggest climber, I guess, for me. Um, the rest rest have mostly stayed the same. I think Zachary Branch might flip flop with Burden as well. Uh, but he's a kid I've been high on for this whole time, and uh, I've talked about it earlier with these freshmen that is the time to buy is now because you're not going to get them uh, going forward. I think Branch, like Branch and Stewart, as soon as this class graduates, they're one two for Debbie next year for me. I think I think Stewart should be the front runner. I think what he's done so far and his pedigree and stuff and Bridge has flashed already and that you can't teach that kind of natural talent that he has. His physical abilities are unteachable. So a lot in the past, like with doing 
I got a lot of flack just in Debbie mocks and stuff doing them this this summer about taking Branch and and Dickey and whoever else my my top freshmen were how aggressively I draft them. Um, but the if you go back and look at who else is going around them, the guys were like Bucky Irving and those types of guys that are going to be like depth running back at the next level. So I don't know. It's just the it's just the way I value them and I target them aggressively. So it's the way I'm going to rank them. Yeah, it makes sense. Talk about talk about Dickey for a minute. Are you? We haven't really seen we, we haven't seen Dickey hit the field yet. He's a true freshman. Are you concerned at this point or not yet? Uh, not yet for me. I was I'm really high on him, probably higher than most. But he's he's also a five star kid, and he was like a top two or three receiver in the class too, for, depending on your on your uh, recruiting service you're looking at. He was slow, like he had a knee injury, so he didn't participate in spring or anything. Uh, any of the camps so he's just coming around the form now he's played a little bit of snaps in the two blowouts they've had he hasn't recorded any stats which is not great obviously but i'm not panicking on him yet and I'm, it's too early to it's too early to panic sell on someone that i was that high on uh but even if like for me even if you're doing your own rankings or whatever else that you can slot whoever you want whoever your wide receiver two is in the freshman class in that spot if it's cardinal tate or Brendan innes or Makai Lemon or Jonte Cook, who I have a couple spots lower. Uh, I would just, if that's your preference on one of those players, that's where I would slot them in. Because I think if if you're that high on them, that that ultimate upside is higher than some of the guys that's a little lower on the list. Yep. And yeah, for me, similarly, it was ultimate upside that thrust Travis Hunter into my into my top 10. And I'm utterly aware of the risks with throwing Travis Hunter into my top 10. But to me, the ultimate upside play is worth having him there because this is, again, this is Debbie. And Debbie is a game of swinging for upside. And Travis Hunter's upside is as elite as anyone you're going to see on the field. And what he's done so far for Colorado as a receiver has been unbelievable not to mention he's also playing cornerback. Is there a risk he could flip over to cornerback? There is a risk he could flip to cornerback. There's also a risk that if I put Carnell Tate there, that Jeremiah Smith comes in next year. So there's a risk that Carnell Tate falls down the pole and doesn't quite keep up the production as well. There's risks with everything you do in Debbie. So when you see potential absolute elite high upside talent for me that's what thrusts hunter into that place because it's just a risk worth taking yeah i agree i i think he's probably gonna play cornerback at the next level probably but i get it i got your point and i don't know i still get i still get the feeling that he's gonna try and play both sides of the position both sides of the ball even at the nfl level I get that inkling from him that he's that, that's something he wants to like he wants to be like a Dion. He wants to have that be that kind of kid. And I mean he's talented enough to do it. And just touching on that as well, while we're on the wide receivers, um, it's something I've referenced before about the, the freshman thresholds, how low they are. Just to give ourselves a plug in for next week, we have Austin and Chris Moxley from uh, Campus Canton come on. Uh, we're going to focus on talking on your year one zero theory, which is their their theory, working theory that they have for going over freshman wide receiver thresholds um, and what is positive and positive negative indicators for future success in the NFL for for fantasy. Um, so just make sure you tune in for that one because I don't want to I don't want to trip over my own feet trying to go over it, but um, it's just something I I keep bringing up is like how low the thresholds are. So when I talk about like a branch or Dickey or John Tech who I have up there, who is he's got a little bit of run with Texas, but he's not going to have a lot because they already have Worthy and Adnan Mitchell, who's a guy I'm really high on. Um, they're fighting for a Big 12 championship and probably a chance at the playoff. So it's questionable how much run they'll give to a true freshman receiver. Um, but I just want people to realize how low the thresholds are and 
keep that in mind when you're ranking guys and being aggressive in, in drafting them, that it's not something their year one production is not something to deter them, deter you from taking a chance on these guys if you think they have that seal if they're a ceiling play over a secondary guy who you would have ranked lower. Yeah, absolutely couldn't agree more. And we're really excited to have those guys on to talk about to talk about the year one zero concept, how they came up with it, how it was how it's been tracked and developed and how to really look at data over the course of years and figure out what actually matters in a freshman year. And as you keep mentioning, what actually matters is something that's a very small something, but it matters a lot. So that'll be a really fun episode to dig into that with those guys. And I also don't want to say anything more about it because I know we're going to dedicate full hours worth of time to it next week. Yeah. So going back to like, like Luther Burden, who we both have relatively high, he'll be, he's, I guess you can, he's off to a really good start this year. He's going to be in the conversation for Debbie wide receiver one next year as well. Um, he's a guy that there was a lot of pushback on Twitter and in Debbie spaces uh, this off season about his year one performance because of his lack of efficiency. Um, and people were saying that, you know, he, he got playing time because he went to Missouri and they had no one else besides Lovett who transferred out and they just gave him a starting spot and they manufactured all these touches for him. Uh, but he didn't do a whole lot with them and it wasn't impressive at the same fact, the same time, the counterpoint to that is he's a true freshman. He's a five-star. He started right away and they manufactured touches for him because how talented he is. Was he efficient with them? No. He's raw as a prospect. His route running is not super polished. Then we had all these questions about whether he even tracked the ball and catch the ball downfield because we didn't see it. We didn't see it because their offense was pedestrian and their quarterback play was putrid last year. This year, he's off to a hot start. I think he has close to 300 yards receiving already. Um, you see him getting the ball down the field. He's making plays at the catch point. He's kind of showing all the things that we had questions about. Uh, so he's just a perfect example of why you don't want to move off of one of those top end prospects because of their year one production and efficiencies and whichever else. So we'll just throw that out there. No, I think that's a great point. And Egbuka is another great example of that. Sitting up there at number two, you look at his freshman year, he had a, he had nine catches for 191 yards his entire freshman year in 2021. And then sophomore year absolutely exploded. So yet another example. And he obviously had a more crowded, he obviously had a more crowded depth chart, which contributed to it, but they still found ways to get him on the field. And it goes to why even at a big school with a lot of prospects and a lot of talent in those rooms, don't be afraid to invest in talent when you see it. And that's why you hear us talking about go after those guys, go after those high five stars, those five star, those high four star guys that you like and invest in them. Yeah, we go running Debbie, back? like we talked about earlier. How, yeah, we still running back. Backs. No, no, you should finish your point though. Yeah, so I was just going like uh, we talked about earlier how the markets change and these guys fluctuate in value, and you have a chance to trade and capitalize on that value. But when we're talking about these guys now, we're talking about their upside in the NFL and what we see them as future prospects and how they impact your NFL team aside from the values that they're going to gain and lose and whatever over time. So it's uh, the whole thing is the player evaluation part of it is individualistic. Every player has to look at on their own. And the, the big thing to remember with situations is that they're situational, right? So these guys are going to change. Anything can happen. Quarterbacks change, transfer portal. There's any number of things that can happen. So just try not to put too much emphasis positively or negatively on the player's current situation and try and look at it as a whole 
as their player profile, as their skill set, their traits that will carry on to the NFL level and go from there. Agreed. All right, so on to running backs. Uh, I'm not going to lie, ranking these running backs was not the most fun exercise, to, to put it nicely. Uh, the, the running back landscape is complicated to say the least in college football and frankly in the NFL in, in the NFL as the nature of the position changes. I think we're just seeing this these changes trickle all the way down. And I know we talk about it a lot, but it's become a very hard position to rank and to really think about high impact upside. And with the exception of really high impact guys that get incredibly high draft capital, it's it's incredibly hard to predict that high end consistent production. With that said, my top 12 Debbie running backs in order, Nicholas Singleton, Travion Henderson, Quinshawn Judkins, Will Shipley, Katron Allen, Justice Haynes, CJ Baxter, Damian Martinez, Raheem Sanders, Trevor Etienne, Roderick Robinson the second, and Audric Estime made his way into my top 12. I know yeah, Kevin's happy. To, I know Kevin's Trayvon happy. Henderson, to hear that one. Jenkins, Katron Allen, CJ Baxter, Will Shipley, Raheem Sanders, Jace McClellan, Justice Haynes, Ruben Owens, Trey Benson, and Damian Martinez. So a lot of the same names. A lot of the same names. And one glaring we both omission. got Damian Mar <laughs> And one glaring omission. Who's your glaring omission? Yeah, Braylon Allen is a guy that we've talked about that I'm not super high on. You're obviously not super high on no. either. Um, he's had an okay start to the season, um, but he has been splitting a lot of time with Ches Malusi, who I don't think anyone considers an NFL caliber running back or at least not a day two or above caliber running back. And I don't know, Braylon, he's just a, he's just a guy that I don't chase that archetype. He's six foot two, 240 pounds. Um, not great vision. Uh, I don't know. His receiving, even his, they're making a point of emphasis to get him the ball in the receiving game, and it's it's obvious that they're making it a point to do it, and it's not coming naturally, and it's not part of the game flow. He had another, I think, another like two catches for five yards this week, and he has like two yards a catch over like a pretty good sample size now over three games, like has to be close to. 16, 17 catches now for less than 40 yards, I believe. Uh, that's just not something that's a translatable skill to the NFL, I wouldn't think. He also, for me, he doesn't he doesn't play to his size. So I'm not there's not not a benefit to being 240 pounds if you don't play like it. I just see him, I don't know. For for me, he just he's just one of those guys that he just leaves a lot of plays on the field. He tends to get stuffed at the line of scrimmage and have a bunch of two and three yard runs. And then when the game's out of hand and over with, he breaks like a 60 or 70 yard run and it has his stats and shows up in the box score. But he's just not, he's just not an archetype that I chase. Yeah, I definitely agree. It's, it's why he made his way out of my top 12 and was somebody that I was not, ever excited about when I started, when I started getting into Debbie, doing Debbie CCC drafts, I have zero shares. And I just, I just see, I just see a guy who I think is, just does not have that translatable style. And the production this year is not what it was or needs to be. I think for somebody of that archetype to actually make it, it needs to be because of overwhelmingly efficient and excellent production. And to your point, I just think we're, it's, it's not an awful start, but he, he is not, he is not standing out to me and just didn't make it into my top 12. I have other guys in there that I like a lot more. Uh, I'm if when we're looking at this current incoming running back class, I am higher than what I think the current Debbie consensus is on Will Shipley. I think it's interesting that 
Shipley has seemingly has taken a hit in his Debbie valuation this off season. And I'm not entirely sure why I think Shipley has Shipley in some ways is almost opposite to all the ways you just described Braylon Allen. Uh, he's a really good pass catcher. Yeah. He's really dynamic in the open field. He actually, when I've gone through Will Shipley tape, I've expected to see a guy that I would never feel comfortable running between the tackles. And that's not actually the case with him. He's over 200 pounds. He meets the BMI and the weight height ratio thresholds that are needed to be a strong NFL back. And he's had the history of production. I, I think he's a guy whose game I really do see translating pretty well to the NFL level in contrast to Allen. Yeah, I'm the same way. I still have Shipley as my RB2 in the class. So, yep. I'm there with He's you. been that way for forever. That's what I said like a while ago that after all the all the jockeying and, and pumping up of Braylon Allen and Raheem Sanders and people knocking Travion Henderson for his injury year, that for me, when it's all said and done, I think that Henderson and Shipley are going to be one and two, just like they were in their recruit rankings and they have been all along. He's a, I, I think he's, Will Shipley's a modern day NFL back. He's, if you look at what teams are targeting and you look at teams like what Buffalo did and took James Cook and the role he has there, Will Shipley's the same style, except way, he has way more production. He's, he's been a way, way more productive college running back. He's been, he has the receiving chops. He scores a ton of touchdowns. He's really efficient around the goal line. That's what you look for for those guys that are in that 205 to 210 pound range. All You look at all the guys who have been mega fantasy producers from Christian McCaffrey to Aaron Jones to Alvin Kamara to Austin Eckler. They all kind of fit that same mold where they're hyper efficient around the end zone. They catch a ton of passes and they play They play from between the, the 20s. They, they play from the 20 yard, 20 yard line in. They, they're goal line red zone backs. And they're even when you pair them with a guy who's like a two down grinder, like AJ Dillon is with Green Bay, and we saw Mark Ingram with Kamara and in, in New Orleans. They don't; those guys don't need to be eighty percent snap share opportunity guys. They split 60-40 workloads, even fifty fifty workloads, but they get the high priority, high value targets and goal line work, and they, it catapults them up into the upper tiers of of fantasy. Yep. No, I absolutely couldn't agree more. And I think I'm always looking for those backs that seem to have that ability to do multiple things uh, whenever in the rankings. This is why Raheem Sanders has been a hard one because I had him much higher and he has definitely moved down. At he was He was a faller for me and I didn't totally expect that coming into this year. But it's just as you're learning more and seeing more, the reason he was up so high as well is he really does have that. He does have that dynamic ability. He is much more of a natural pass catcher. He transitioned, he he played tight end wide receiver in high school and he transitioned to running back. So he has that in his history. Yeah. He's just, we need to see him a little bit on the field this year. When we did see him in game one, he looked so big and so plotting that I really need to see some of the things that we were starting to see last year. But even as I go back and watch that tape now, there's something about the upright running style that really is holding me back from being as high as I once was on him. And I cannot look at his tape and not see that anymore and not think it's a really big impact to the way that his game is going to translate. Yeah, and he's another guy that for being 240, pounds he doesn't always play like it yeah to me i would like to see him come down 10 or 15 pounds i would like to see him come in around 220 and play at 220 now 220 is that a good size back with that with his receiving ability he had huge production last year in the sec but i don't know how much of it was like the rpo style they played with kj jefferson because kj jefferson had a ton of rushing upside there last year too he's just a guy that that it seems like the fantasy community kind of 
jump the gun on and wanted to have that next guy or be that next big thing. Like he was been catapulted way above Travion this offseason. You know, most people, or not most people, but a lot of people had him as their their RB1 and Debbie coming into the year or RB2 behind Judkins. I just don't know. And he's another guy that he's not getting – he before he got hurt or before he came in at 240 pounds, he wasn't getting – he's not getting draft points. He's not talked in draft circles as a guy that NFL teams are coveting. So I don't know what to do with him. I still like him, but I, mean, and I don't think he's going to attack very well either. Like I don't – he's going to – like he could run like a 4-6 – I don't know if you want to, like if he runs in the four, four high four fives four six area. The weight, I'm just not sure. But if you if you like compare him to say like Damian Martinez, who I thought I was high on at twelve, and you have at eight nine eight somewhere in there eight. Damian Martinez, I am eight. He he plays every bit of two hundred and thirty pounds. When you watch Damian Martinez run, he runs with every bit of 230 pounds. He dishes it out. He he takes on contact head on, breaks tackles. He has phenomenal footwork for a running back that size, and he has he has huge burst. Like the way he hits the holes and gets to the second level, and then takes on contact on the second and third level, is night and day with with the other guys his size. It, it's to me. It it pops on tape way more than watching Braylon Allen. The only knock on Martinez for me is he doesn't have any kind of receiving profile whatsoever. So I don't know if we're gonna have that same kind of uh Kenneth Walker conversation when he gets drafted of can he do it and just didn't do it, or is it something he can't do? But I mean he's still got all of this year and then another year to to work work on it or to prove it or maybe it's there and he just they just don't play that way but he's come out on fire to start the season he's averaging like eight yards a carry or something like that yeah i think the receiving in the pack yeah, well, I, think his, the... I think his sorry finish yeah, go ahead no, go no ahead. i was just gonna say i think his I, the, the receiving profile thing is something that I'm finding challenging. And the Kenneth Walker example is a really good one, is that I'm always trying to figure out, is there any, can he do it? And he's just not getting the chance to do it because they're just not scheming it in. And that's, that's a key question that's going to have to get answered. And especially looking at, it's also something that I do see getting developed as running backs go on in college that they get a little bit more of it he's not getting a ton more of it so far this year so his his receiving work has not had a huge upswing yet so we definitely will need to see a little bit more of that but i couldn't agree more with you the reason he's there is when he walk when i watch him on tape the pop is unbelievable like he stands out on the field in a way that a lot of guys don't and that's the type of stuff that I think translates and it's the type of stuff that gets guys into. And for a running back, you don't have to be, you don't have to be in the first round. Very few of these guys are likely to be in the first round when they're going to the NFL. I think. So he just seems like a guy, none of them. So he just seems like a guy that could work his way into second, uh, you know, a day two pick possibility. Yeah, I think that's a possible outcome. The problem I've juggled with that class is that, like, you have Trevor Etienne, who I've been like the biggest Trevor Etienne guy there or that there is out there, and I almost kick myself for having like Trey Benson where I have him and not Etienne because I think Etienne probably has a higher ceiling in the long run. Um, the problem I've juggled with that class is the class is so good and so deep already. And there's guys like like Jay Miller, who I'm a big fan of, Alabama, who hasn't really had a chance to play yet. Is it, That's the first class that I totally dug in as recruits. And I kind of have second-guessed myself to whether the class is really that strong so far or if I'm just more invested in them from the beginning that I'm projecting that and wanting them to be. So that's something I've juggled both in the receivers and the in the running backs, but 
I think when you break it down and look at it, look across the landscape right now, I, the, it looks like the strongest class from running back and wide receivers. And at the top, like we both have Singleton. I would say Singleton and Henderson are both like a 1A and 1B for me. I think Singleton gets a bit of a nudge, not only because he's been healthy this whole time, but his size speed combination is freakish athleticism that you just don't find very often. Uh, but I think overall, the Debbie community has soured on Trevor Anderson way, way, way too much. I think he's he's not had the, the output yet this year because they haven't given him the touches. They haven't relied on him. But I don't know how much of that is Ohio State being aware that they don't have to. They have other guys there, and they don't have to lean on them. And when the time comes when they get to play into the harder schedule and they play the Michigans and Penn State and whoever else and get to the playoff, I think they're going to lean on him then because he provides the most bang for your buck at, at running back for their, in that room. And I don't think it's relatively close. I think his freshman season, when you go back and look at it, should speak volumes to you that you – they did rely on him so heavily because they had national championship aspirations. They had a team that was capable of it, and they chose to go to him as early as the first or second game of the season and not look back. I think the injury being there sapped a lot of that, a lot of that hype and a lot of the production from last year. And I know people, I realize people want to see it again, but I think people are putting too much emphasis on that it's not like he tore his achilles he didn't tear his acl he had a broken foot and he played through most of it and you could tell on tape he wasn't the same he couldn't cut the same way he couldn't put weight on it the same way but i think if you if that injury doesn't happen the trajectory he started in his freshman season that carried through till now you're talking about him as a year from now being the rb2 in dynasty or rb3 behind gibbs depending on what he does he's not going to get to He's not going to get to Bijan level prospect. And I think he's probably still a second round pick. But I think his talent level and his traits, I think, are on, on par or higher than what you see with like Brees Hall, for example. I think Travion, his traits, his athleticism, his acceleration, his change of direction, he's also six or 5'11, 215 pounds. He can play with power. You saw a couple weeks ago that his touchdown, he ran over at, at the goal line, took him on head on. I think we've, we've taken his his whole prospect profile for granted because he was so good his freshman season that I think we're fading him way too, way too much. And a year from now, it would not surprise me at all if he was the RB2 in Dynasty. That is a, yeah, and that's a huge statement. And it's going to be interesting to see as he as this season plays out whether he whether he hits that, but he definitely had that coming out of that freshman year. And you're right, that injury just hit a hit hit a full stop on it. And he also didn't a partially injury related, but he just didn't he didn't look that great. Just not looking that great last year really soured a lot of people on him, but that's a really interesting idea. Maybe he could actually get back up there and you're right. His profile just hits perfectly. Um, Nick Singleton. Is Nick Singleton a Bijan level prospect for you? No, no, he doesn't have the same instincts as a runner. Athletically. Yeah. Like I think, Honestly, I think, I think like the level of prospect, I don't think he's going to get there because I don't think teams will invest the draft capital the same. But I think he could get on par with like Saquon. I think he's that he could be that level of athlete. And I think Saquon Barkley is like similarity. They went to Penn State and whatever else. And I'm a Giants fan, so I know how overdrafted he was because it's set the franchise back. But I think. To me, he's like watching Barkley play all the time. He he doesn't have the same instincts as a runner either as as Bijan does. He gets away with a lot of stuff because he's so powerful and so strong and such a great athlete. And you see it like I know some of the injuries have taken some of the stuff away, but his yards per carry, which isn't everything, but 
his yards per carry have not been up to the level of NFL average and even not even measured up to other Giants running backs because everyone wants to blame the offensive line and whichever else is. He He's the same spot. He's kind of the same way as that, like the Braylon Allen they said, like how he gets stuffed at the line of scrimmage or has negative runs a bunch of times, and then he just cracks one off for 65, 70 yards, hits the end zone, makes your fantasy day, all is forgiven. But <laughs> in the landscape of actual running back, I think there's a big – there's a disconnect between his value and his performance as an actual running back and his value and his performance as a fantasy running back to me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Anyone else on this list that you want to highlight? Uh I mean, Jace McClellan sticks out because I'm still on that bandwagon and people are bailing off left, right, and center now. He was like a guy that a lot of people, a lot of CFF guys thought he was just going to follow that path of the Brian Robinson and Najee Harris and these other Bama running backs who have stayed the course and stayed committed to the program and bid their time. And then year four comes around and they get this full workload and smash and then go on to NFL and have success there i don't know what the reluctancy is to give him a full workload it just hasn't happened yet the first game was a blowout he scored a touchdown early and then sat um second game was kind of a split this past week against central or uh usf they struggled all game and their quarterback play was atrocious but mccollum had a good start he started off with like 70 something yards in the first half or into the early third quarter. I think there was a weather delay. Yards on four carries in the first half, got all the run in the second half, and ended up with like 125 yards and a touchdown. So I don't know what I don't know why they won't give McClellan the full workload, but he's a guy that I'm staying on for Debbie because I still think he's probably for me he's still a top three or four back in the class. He's still gonna test really well. He was like the top spark athlete the Nike opening his high school senior year. Uh, he's same thing. He's 5'11", 212, 215. Really good size just the athlete. He's got a three down skill set. I just, I'm going to stay the course. I think he's one of those guys that you could see. We've seen it with, like we said, Brian Robinson, who's like the guy with the commanders now who wasn't, who's a, not as good of an athlete as Jason Cullen is. But we've seen a lot of these Alabama guys who, I don't know if it's the competition in the room or Whatever the case may be, you've seen it with Josh Jacobs, who ended up being a first-round pick, but wasn't overly productive there. Kenyon Drake kind of got lost in the shuffle there. He's had success in the NFL. Derrick Henry, obviously, you've seen what he did, but he split time at Alabama as well. It's just, I don't know. I I thought he would get the workload, and I thought he would have this big year, and it would it would lead to the draft capital. But for me, he's still a guy that I'm in on the traits and is physical abilities and I still think he has a chance to be a better pro than he's been in college Um, he's someone I've been planting my flag on him I'm not going to hop off now but it would be nice it would be nice to see them rely on him a little more down the stretch and maybe they will now maybe now they're going back to Milro and maybe they know that this is their their way around it I don't like Saban's the goat when it comes to coaching, right? You've already seen this a terrible loss already. I guess not terrible, but an early loss to Texas was not something you regularly see. Terrible performance against USF. And you got to think he's going to make some kind of adjustments. You got to think going back to Milrow, maybe they rely on, maybe they rely on the run game. Maybe he gets that offensive line going and they're like, this is what we're doing. We're, our, our wide receiver room is a wasteland. We're just going to run the ball 50 times down your throat and dare you to stop us. And then maybe the production comes, but he's just not, he's the guy I'm not going to get off of. And it also speaks to the running back landscape in college football right now for me that, that I'm still comfortable (laughs) having him there knowing that he's basically still just a recruiting profile and an athletic and athletic testing. That's what he's going on. That's, and he still fits within the top 12. 
yeah, I think that's how you have to look at running back at this point is you've got to just keep it, keep focus on the profiles and keep focus on the talent and keep the guys that are skilled there. And I think that in some ways that's always been the case with running back. Occasionally we get these outliers that are just incredible performers, but there's really no reason to be con- in some ways there's no reason to be concerned with lack of a workload because it doesn't necessarily translate to an inability not to succeed at the next level. So I, I think that's spot on. And I think when, when we're looking at these running backs, it is, it is a, it is a trait hunt. Uh, it, it is definitely a, it's a trait hunt. It's a game hunt. And that's the only way to look at it because it has been a very rough start to the year for, for all of the Debbie running backs, especially at the top end with the SEC, where we've kind of embedded some of this stock up, stock down conversation, but Quinchon Judkins, after lighting the world on fire last year, has come out this year and had one of the most inefficient starts to the year that we've seen Certainly compared to what he did last year, he's been incredibly inefficient, but he has not let the world lit the world on fire. Sanders has obviously been out. Allen has been sharing a backfield and not getting anything near the production that he did the year before. And you're just kind of seeing this go down the list. 3.3 yards per carry yeah. so far this year for, for judgments, 3.3. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like all these guys that were propped up, all these guys that were up at the top of the, the heavy running back rankings have all just all at the same time. It's just kind of just evaporated. Like even Trey Benson, who I still have up there as my eleven, it, the trajectory he was on at the end of last year was you know people people talking about him as the RB one in all of Debbie, the RB one in this class. The I talked about how I thought a lot of that was baked into. Uh, Florida State success, and they've been, although they had a close game this week, they had a big big win against LSU, and they're they're on the trajectory to win the ACC. We'll see if they get past Clemson, which hopefully they do. Um, but a lot, of, I thought a lot of that his value was tied to the team success, and he's not been. He had a three touchdown game, but he's not been great to start the year. Uh, and there's a lot less competition there. Like Lawrence Tilfield is a decent running back, but he's smaller. He's like a 190 pound guy who's like a change of pace guy. So he shouldn't be threatening the workload for Benson. Uh, but none of the guys have none of the guys have taken a step or elevated their games. I'd argue that most of them have kind of taken a step backwards. But it seems like Travion's the one that people keep targeting as I don't know if it's people are want to hate on on Ohio State or or people just want to have the I told you so, or it's just prospect fatigue. So we talked about such as freshman season, but he seems to be the one that people are piling on. But I don't think any of them, especially in this class, have done anything to, to elevate their status or even even I want to say even warrant their status, really. Which is a big thing we talked about last week. How you know if you if you targeted all these guys in your Debbie drafts instead of the 25 wide receiver class, which we went over, like you're, you can't be happy at this point. And I wouldn't imagine they're getting any happier in the next year or so. Yep. No, I, I completely agree. And I think this, I, it'll be interesting to see what this 25 class, because they do look, they do look better, I would say, than a lot of the 24 class running backs look. And with that said, it'll just be interesting to see how this goes over time. And I almost, there's a weird part of me that wonders if just with how much this position is changing, whether we don't start to see this happen a little more where we don't see guys repeating multiple years of high end true volume or course level production, even in college. And where when younger talent comes in, they start to get more of the workload and where guys have one big year and struggle to sustain it for multiple years and or their teams find other people to get the balls in the hand to to get the ball in their hands and start to change it up. 
I don't know if that's going to be yeah, a trend. It just doesn't seem like there's those big. I don't know. Even like even top of like we both have Singleton and Catron Allen in our top fives, both. Yeah. Five six yeah. area. Yeah. They're like they're both like a 50-50 workload split, right? So they're those are both based on those are both talent projections at this point. Neither one of them are gonna like they'll have their games, they go back and forth and one leads one game, one leads the other, but there's they're basically a 50-50 split. So neither one of them are going to have, if they both stay at Penn State, which I don't see why they wouldn't, neither one of them are going to have the high-end production levels to to warrant the draft capital. I mean, it's, it's on trades, right? Like we said. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's interesting. It's interesting to see. Like, Judkins and and Rocket Sanders are the two guys you, you thought would have just Carry those massive workloads this year. We'll see if Sanders, when he comes back, is healthy. If he gets back to that, owning it. But I mean, they have other, they have other kids there, and like um, AJ Green looked good this weekend. Uh, they have a couple other kids there. Ole Miss has a couple recruits. Like Briscano got some pub this year in spring. It's just, it's interesting. It's, it's that nobody's, nobody seems to be taking a hold of the mantle as. Top end can't miss prospects. No, that's right, and it'll be. And you see that. I, the... And I just wonder if that was if what we saw with Bijan and Gibbs was. I I wonder if we're going to see anything close to that for a while, and I'm not sure we are. I don't think so. And you see, like even like the schools like Alabama, um, Texas now. Texas has like bringing in Baxter and then they got Jarek Gibson coming in next year and they're highly recruiting. Like it's almost like the big, these big schools are having like stables of running backs where they're comfortable rolling two or three of them through and not relying heavily on one, any one kid at one time. It's, it's interesting to see if that is the way it goes and it keeps going or, or who knows. Definitely. Anything else on, running backs before we talk about some more future prospects? Uh, I don't think so. I think we've, I think our guys, our lists are pretty straightforward. A lot of the same guys. Yeah, like yeah, Ruben Owens is a kid I've bumped up recently too, but simply for the fact that he has an elite trait and that he has absolute home run track speed and he's a five-star kid and that's and he's playing already as a freshman he's you saw he he had basically an even split this week i think he had like eight carries for 50 yards and a touchdown or something like that um and jimbo has a, a history of putting running backs in the league so he's a kid that i've bumped up but it's it's that simple it's that it's that easy to justify betting on him at this stage of just simply being a five-star kid with an elite trait. Yeah, it's wild. It, it's just it is wild to see for sure. Um, I am I I continue to move I continue to move estimate up my board. I just I love the I I love the kid's game so much. I think he's. He doesn't have a ton of receiving work, but he has some. And I don't think you actually need a ton in college, as I mentioned. And he just looks, he he absolutely pops on tape for me. And I'm excited to see how the rest of the year goes for him. And we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I have some shares of him and Debbie and C2C. Uh, he's a massive kid, and he's like I saw his his uh, GPS track time was like 21 miles an hour or something like that. Yes, it is. Like a couple weeks ago, which is hauling for a kid that size. But I think that like I I don't I don't, I don't have him. I I don't think know where I have him. I have him in my top 20. I think just because I think it's so scarce. But I don't think he's out of place here. But I do think it speaks to the landscape of the running back it does. in Debbie that. You know, he's basically a, a, a two down 
grinder that that we're projecting as you know being a top 12 asset right now i don't know yeah, i think is what that is hard well running backs i think are hard running backs are hard for that simple fact of how like we saw trey benson come out of nowhere last year kenneth walker his draft year it just takes the one year it just takes the perfect storm of you know of a team in the transfer portal whatever it is uh kenneth if you look at kenneth walker's season like Michigan State had a Cinderella season that year and have fallen apart since then. Like everything that could go right went right for them that season. Um, if if they're a you know a six and six team or something like that, is he getting second round draft capital? Is are his traits enough to carry him? It's hard. It's hard at this point with with running backs to go. It's not often that they go wire to wire as top like top guys like Trevion Henderson or or that type of stuff. So it's difficult. Like I said earlier, like I had like Jim Miller is a kid from Alabama that I'm really high on. I already have Justice Haynes on here, who's their freshman this year, and Jason McClellan. And Richard Young's a guy that we both talked about a lot that we both like from this freshman class that people were down on. That you got you could get for free in Debbie. You got them super cheap in C2C drafts. And as much as like we can't just sit here and be like, Here's four Alabama running backs to draft them all. It's not a bad strategy. Maybe not in Debbie because your league will be more shallow, but it's a pretty simple strategy in C2C that if you get them at value to target those guys who are at a school like Alabama that have a history of putting kids in the league at the position, and he's a high four-star kid, he's got just as good of a shot as anyone down the road to lead that backfield and end up getting day two draft capital. Yep. Couldn't agree more. Um, with that said, I know for next man up this week, you're previewing a running back. So does, does Jordan Marshall have Great a segue. chance? I thought that was perfect. I'm, I'm glad you did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's a, yeah. So Jordan Marshall is a Ohio kid who's going to Michigan. He's I think I think my RB four in this class. Um, his stats impossible to find this year on Max Preps. I look uh, last year his stats in Max Preps where we had I think four hundred fifty seven rushing yards in three games at like ten yards a carry. Um, he's a he's an interesting kid. He's got a real nice skill set. He's he's a Decent receiver out of the backfield. He uh his running he has excellent vision and and um really good footwork, really good fundamentals. He reminds me of, of Brees Hall in that he's he's slipperier than he is like breaking tackles and evading tackles. He's just one of those guys that just seems to get skinny through holes and guys kind of slide off him when they go to tackle him rather than him like using pure power to, to break through and stuff. I don't think he's the same athlete, not right now anyways, as Brees Hall is, but I didn't think Brees Hall was that type of athlete until he ran at the combine either. So it's interesting. Um, but it's a, that's a really, really good spot. He's going to Michigan. You see what Blake Horn's done there. Um, they have a pretty good history of pumping out running backs and getting production out of them, especially under Harbaugh. So, I know a lot of people who are this deep into the recruiting classes and ranking for fantasy and stuff are are really down again next year on the running back class. I don't th think it's that bad. And I think the upper tier guys who are there now are all they're all going to really nice spots. So I think that's not something to look at. Is there this is a first year there I didn't I don't think there are any consensus five star running backs in this year's class that I No, Taylor Tatum's the only five star, I think, yeah. right now. He's committed to Oklahoma. Um, but like like if you go down the list, uh Cam Davis is going to FSU. Um, Jordan Marshall's committed to uh Michigan. James Peoples is a kid I like too. He's committed to Ohio State. 
Uh, Jerk Gibson is committed to Texas. So oh, <coughs> me. they're all they're all in nice landing spots right now, at least. Uh, but the same thing goes back to last year. I wasn't high on last year's running back class, especially at this time. And now there's, you know, Baxter and Ruben Owens and Justice Haynes are all in my top 12 Debbie running backs. So it kind of is what it is. Interesting. Um, I am going to talk about an athlete for mine. And I'm going to talk about Aaron Butler, who is from Calabasas, California. And he is going to Colorado. And I did not see myself going exactly in this direction, but I guess I'm, I'm sticking with the Travis Hunter theme because Aaron Butler is gets called by some people sort of the next Travis Hunter kind of fine for Deion Sanders. Uh, his father played football with Deion, former teammate of his, and he ended up ended up committing to Colorado over Oregon, Georgia, Alabama, had all, all the offers. He's six feet, 175 right now. And I've been going through and just watching tape from a bunch of these, a bunch of these wide receivers. And I just, you, you really, you really look for, I look for pop. I look for somebody that really pops out and stands out to me on tape. And Aaron Butler stands out to me on tape for a lot of reasons. I, I love, I love the way he runs routes. I love the way that he is physical after the catch and just is not afraid to just kind of put his shoulder into guys and run them over at 175 pounds. I think his physicality is really strong. He's got incredibly electric speed. His moves and his awareness of space after the ball, there's a highlight where he gets kind of wrapped up in a tackle and kind of spins out in this unbelievable way and just opens up the entire field for himself. Um, he returns kicks. And one of the things I had held off on him just because his he was kind of last year, his production as a junior receiving wise wasn't, it wasn't bad, but he had 38 catches, 830 yards, uh, 13 TDs, which is really nice. But the 38 catches kind of threw me off a little bit. Through four games this year, he's already got 28. So it's really clear. It looks to me like he is investing and his team at Calabasas is investing in developing him as that wide receiver. And he just has, I'm going to be honest, he has a different element. He has a different element of swagger to his game that I really appreciate. I, I, I may be biased from this because I'm sure you'll appreciate this. I watched a mic'd up clip of him and I just heard him and just his energy on the field, the way he like talks himself up, talks his teammates up, gets in guys' faces. He's so incredibly confident and he just seems to have that I love that in incoming, like, I love that quality in incoming freshmen. I think it often really does help with how they translate just from an off the field standpoint, but the production so far this year, he's already got 28 catches for 586 yards, an average of 21 yards a catch and five TDs through just four games. He had one game of 255 yards and he, it is clear that they're investing him in, a, in him as a receiver. And I think he's going to walk into Colorado and have a shot to actually play and maybe play with Shadur if, if, if Shadur sticks around and get into that incredibly high powered offense. So Aaron Butler's one to keep an eye on. He's not even in the wide receiver ranks. He's technically categorized as an athlete because he does play both sides of the ball, but he's one I'm keeping an eye on as someone who fits that Travis Hunter mold and someone who for me might fit that really high upside mold with his athleticism. Yeah, he's an interesting one. I know I wasn't as high on him the first time through when I, when I watched him, um, but it'll be interesting to see what kind of recruits they get on the offensive side of the ball uh, going forward with the success they've had early on. I know like Bryce Underwood, the 2025 QB1 is, I think, I think he took his OB last week, or you're supposed to take a competitive there. He's a Michigan kid, but I don't think he's going to stick around Michigan. 
Um, so there's a lot of heavy rumors of him going to Colorado to be the guy after Shador. So that would be interesting. Yeah, it'd be really fun. All right. I think that's all we got for this week. And be sure to tune in next week. Uh, we have an incredible episode coming where, as Todd mentioned earlier, we are going to talk with uh, both Austin and Chris Moxley from the Campus Canton team about year one zero and the impact of basically, which is basically a theory of how much freshman year on field impact has on your long term potential going all the way to the NFL. Yep. If I sum that up correctly. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that'll do for this week. Uh make sure you join us next week for that. And big shout out to our guy Vince at Dynasty Gens for uh putting the graphics together for this too. We couldn't have done this without him. He's the best. So thanks again. Did know that. Uh-huh. Yeah, the revolution, y'all, y'all, y'all. Yep, the revolution. The revolution, y'all, will not be televised. Yeah, you gotta wake up, open your eyes. Make a change in your life. And find a new way of living. It's time to start living for the children. Everybody look into my life. Tell me what you see. The perseverance of a young man sitting is so free. LA Mac be the champ, but still fighting the struggle. They couldn't shut my mouth with a muzzle. I'm hard to figure like a puzzle. My name ought to be Jigsaw. Wrap right around the edges. I've been known to spit raw. 